Well, if you were with us last Sunday, then you remember Matthew was with us. The writer of the book of Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples, and he was giving a monologue, if you can call it that, about the last week in Jesus' life. That holy week. We started with Thursday, Monday, Thursday, and then we talked about everything that Jesus went through during that day in his life. And then we went through Friday until Jesus was taken down from the cross. And this morning, we're going to be looking briefly at Saturday, but then we're going to be talking more importantly about Sunday and the events of that resurrection day. So, again, thank you. I am Matthew. Some people call me Levi. I'm glad to be with you today. And I want you to understand the things that I went through, the things that I experienced as I walked with Jesus, as I walked with those other disciples during that last week of Jesus' life. It's Saturday. They've already placed Jesus in the tomb. My thought was, there's no way out. There's no way out. After Jesus' death, and he was placed there in that tomb, I'm thinking, there's no way out now. There is no way out. Well, listen, my friends. That's really how I, Matthew, that's how I felt about my life. When Jesus came to me and called me, and when he said, follow me, follow me. I thought about my life, of where I was, and the things that were taking place in my life. Now, why in the world would I want to follow this man who claimed to be Jesus? I mean, you need to be reminded, I was a pretty well-off guy. And for who I was, I had power, and I knew the right people. I knew the important people. And that old saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, I, I knew the right people back then. Now, the other Jews, well, they despised me. They actually called me a traitor, mainly because I went to work for the Roman government. But now listen, when you are occupied by a foreign power, smartest thing to do is to cooperate with them and to go along with them. You've got to be very practical, and that's what I was trying to do. But here I was, caught in all of this, and I'm thinking, there's no way out. No way out. That's how I felt. That's how I felt about my job. Remember what my job was? I told you last week. I was a tax collector. Nobody liked me. Nobody liked tax collectors then. And it doesn't look like, sound like they like them anymore today. But after I agreed to do that, to take on that job and that responsibility, I'll be honest with you, I had all kinds of doubts whirling through my mind. I really didn't like what I was doing. Because there was no way out. I couldn't stop. There was no place to go. I felt like I was trapped. Now, if I quit... Well, the Jews, well, the Jews really wouldn't accept me. And Lord only knows what the Romans would have done to me because they had no time for a quitter. And that's what they would have seen me to be. So you see, I felt like there's no way out. But one day, this prophet by the name of Jesus passed by my tax booth. He passed by, and wow, I knew who he was. Everybody was talking about him. He was the talk of the town. He looked right at me. I'll never forget this. He looked right at me and said, Matthew, follow me. I want you to follow me. Well, I did. I thought that was my way out. 
But really, why, why would I leave what I had? Even though I really didn't like what I was doing, it was a job. I had my family. I had my home. I had security. Leave all of that to follow this man in a, in a dusty robe and sandals who claimed to be the Messiah? Well, people have asked me, why in the world did you do that, Matthew? Matthew? I'll tell you why I did. Because when Jesus came to me and he looked at me and he said, follow me, I'll never forget his eyes looking into my face. And I saw that understanding and that compassion in his life like I had never seen from anyone else before. Here's a man who should have condemned me, but he didn't. He invited me. He encouraged me. He befriended me. You don't know what that meant to me. You'll have no idea. Living the kind of life I was living. When a man comes and invites me to follow him and encourages me and becomes a friend. I mean, he knew what I was like. He knew that. He knew that I was cynical. He knew that I was hard-hearted. He also knew that I was a lonely man. Deep down inside, only the Lord knew how lonely I was. I just wanted to be loved. I just wanted to be accepted by somebody. I wanted somebody to appreciate me for who I was. And to be honest with you, I really needed a friend. I didn't have very many. And Jesus Christ provided a way out of the hell that I was living in. All that loneliness, that self-conceit, and that self-hate that I had within me. Oh, I remember that Saturday, Saturday after Jesus' crucifixion. I knew it so well. I'll never forget that. I remember how he promised a way out. For me. But why? Why could he have not provided a way out for himself? After all, he could have called a legion of angels to come against those wicked Romans. Why didn't he overpower them like he had overpowered the demons and people that he had healed in the three years that we were together? Why didn't he put those self righteous Pharisees? and preached in their place. He had done that before. Why? Why was there no way out for this man who provided such a way out for so many others in his ministry? So many losers. There were people that were absolutely nobodies. People that were sinners, including me. He provided a way out for them. Why? Why could he have not provided a way out for himself? Why did Jesus have to die like a nobody? All of these things are going through my mind. Now the priest knew. uh, The priest knew that this guy was somebody. They knew that this Jesus guy was somebody important. They knew that he was somebody that could overthrow their system and upset the status quo. They knew that. In fact, I'm convinced that's exactly why they insisted that a guard be placed right there by the tomb. Now, Pilate was tired of their games. He really was. He even told them, use your own Sanhedrin soldiers. And they did. They wanted to make sure there was no way out for this man in this tomb. Now, I was very despondent. My disciples, my fellow disciples, were very despondent. When we looked at all the cruelty of a man who never hurt anybody, a man who who, who changed the lives of so many, who healed so many, who made a difference. It was such a horrific feeling seeing our master 
go through what he had gone through, particularly there in the last week of his life. Then there, that seal that was put on that great big stone in front of the grave, that tomb, and a guard was placed there. And again, what was going through my mind is, there's no way out. There's no way out. But then comes Sunday, that very first Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. You know the story. I tell it in my gospel. So do some of my other cohorts in their gospels. Early, early that Easter morning, the two Marys went to the grave. And they really went to the grave to embalm the body of Jesus. And that was in accordance to Jewish custom. But they get there and they see the stone rolled away. And they heard a voice. They heard a voice of a young man dressed in, in white. While the guards are trembling, they almost look like death warmed over. They knew they had failed somewhere. But then this voice says, in the 28th chapter of Matthew, verses 5, 6, and 7, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus. He was nailed to the cross. But he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come here and see the place where he lay. Quickly now, go and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead. And now, he's going to Galilee ahead of you. There, you will see him. All the women ran. And I believe that they were, they were half believing what they had seen. It was almost impossible. Can this actually be possible? This Jesus who we saw beaten so cruelly and placed in a tomb. And now, he's gone. And there's this voice speaking to us. They heard it. They saw the empty tomb. It was right there. Suddenly, a man appeared. Jesus stepped out of them and said, Greetings. Good morning. Peace, peace be with you. Oh, my goodness. Just try to envision that scene. What was taking place? They fell to his feet. They hugged his feet. They worshipped him. They were absolutely speechless. They couldn't cry. They couldn't laugh. They couldn't do anything. They were stunned with what they had just seen and witnessed. And then Jesus said there in verse 10, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. He's gone. He's gone. Wow. And then the two Marys stood up, and they ran, proclaiming the good news that Jesus is alive. And then in verse 11, we're told, while all of this was going on, the soldiers had returned to town. And they had told the chief priest everything. There's no way out, they're saying. But he's gone. They couldn't figure it out. How did this happen? We know that he was placed in this tomb. The stone rolled up against it. It was sealed. There was no way out. But there was. He was gone. Now, if you know the rest of the stories I recorded there in my gospel, the priest paid the guards a large sum of money. They paid them to lie. They wanted to tell them that that. The disciples had been paid to steal the body while Jesus was sleeping. They had to figure a way out of this. Hmm. 
Listen now. Do you really believe that there's life after death? Do you? Do you really believe there's life after death? That's what I'm saying underneath my breath. When all of this is transpiring and unfolding, what, what's, what's going on in my mind? Is there really life after death? And then Jesus appears right before us. Now some doubted. Some of those disciples doubted. But here I am. And we as disciples, we were confronted with the Lord who had conquered death. Peace be with you. He was alive. Oh my goodness, I just could not comprehend what my eyes were seeing. How things were unfolding. And then I close out my gospel with something Jesus said. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to people everywhere and make them disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe, teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Oh my goodness, a light came on. Somebody flipped the light switch in my mind and in my heart. All of a sudden, the past three years of my life had come together. I realized what Jesus was saying, what he was telling, what he was teaching, what he was foretelling. Wow. There was a way out. Everybody else was saying there wasn't a way out. I was saying there wasn't a way out in my own life, in my own situation, my own prediction, and my own predicament. But God provided a way. See, God provided a way out of death. Jesus found it. In fact, Jesus created a way out of death. He, he is the Lord of heaven. He is the Lord of earth. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, folks, listen. That's why I came back. That's why I come back to you. Because I need to tell you this is true. Jesus Christ did indeed arise, He rose from the dead. Now listen, my friends, I'm not sure where you are in your own life and in your own walk right now, but if you are mourning a loved one, having heard this story of the life and the ministry of Jesus and now coming to this resurrection day, has the light lift on in your own heart and mind? If you have attended a funeral recently of a loved one or a family, seeing all of this unfold, has the light switch flipped on? Are you going through any kind of suffering right now? Are you doubting things? There's just no way out in my situation. The light switch needs to come on. If you believe that there is no way out of your predicament, if you believe that there is no way out of your problems and your situation, then you've got to put your faith in Jesus Christ who can flip that light switch on and bring lightness out of your darkness. The Lord God omnipotent reigns through Jesus Christ. There is a way out. There is a way out. Jesus Christ is the way. Jesus Christ is alive. Death is dead. The Lord has risen. He lives. 
He lives. He lives within my heart. I'm appalled by the people that are just trying to, to kick God, kick Jesus Christ out of everything. Think about our culture. Think about our society. Think about where we are in the world. The mere mention of God or Jesus Christ turns people off. Why have we gotten to that point? Why have we, as individuals who have thought, there's no way out, and God provided a way out? Are we not standing up for our beliefs and what we say we believe? Are we not standing on the teachings and the principles and the precepts of God's word, making a difference in their life? What has brought a world of people to a point in their life when they don't even see the need or the significance of a Savior? Maybe we haven't been doing what we need to do. Some of that has to be pointed at us for neglect. There's a world of lost people out there. There's a world of people right now that's out of a relationship with God. Maybe they've never been in a relationship with him. Maybe they have been in a relationship and now they're out there in the world. They have forsook, forsaken that relationship with God and gone out into the world. They need to have that light switched, turned on to the reality of a Savior that is alive. He, he, he's alive, I know, because he lives in me. You can only know he's alive and be assured of that if you allow him to live and reign in your own heart and in your own life. He is alive. Thank God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, When we see the power of a loving Savior who lived and walked among us as a human, God in the flesh, God incarnate, experiencing the same fears and doubts and anxieties that, that we feel, and then knowing that he laid down his life for the sins of the world. Help us, Lord, to be reminded that for every drop of blood that fell from that cross, Jesus Christ cried out my name, your name, everybody's name, the name of humanity. Because he died for each of us. Help us, Lord, with all the confusion going on in this world right now to pause long enough and ask, Lord, what are you saying to me? How are you speaking to me right now? What do I need to change? What do I need to give to you allow you to flip that switch on and bring light to darkness. May your word penetrate our hearts through the movement and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ who died, was buried, but that's not where it ended was resurrected. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen.
We've had more people here today than we've had in three weeks. I mean, actually living bodies. There's six of us here today. Uh, and I do want to thank Anna for working uh, with the sound. And Jesse, we couldn't do what we're doing without you and your help and your commitment. And again, I can't thank you enough. But I thank all of you all for working and doing your part in helping with the ongoing ministry at Pleasant Ridge Baptist Church. I realize that many of you all are watching now or will be watching later on through social media. I want to thank you for supporting our church, whether it be financially or prayerfully or any other means. You could right now during this hour be watching a lot of different services. A whole lot better preaching, a whole lot better services of what I can offer you here. But many of you all have chosen to support your church by tuning in, and I thank you for that. For the days and weeks ahead, for all the changes that we have out there, for all the reorganizations that we're going to have to be a part of in the days and weeks ahead, whatever the future holds, I don't know. I just know who holds the future, and I'm placing my faith and trust in him. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. See you next week.